suddenly I'm not half the man I used to be There's a shadow hanging over me Oh, yesterday came suddenly Why she had to go I don't know she wouldn't say I said something wrong now I long for yesterday When did you write that? I didn't write it. Paul McCartney wrote it. The Beatles. Who? And that's a clip from yesterday. I'm delighted to say that Danny Boyle, its director, is back on the show. Hello, Danny. Hello again, Simon. Nice to see you. And Himesh Patel, who plays Jack Malik, is here as well. Hello, Himesh. Hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And we heard you in that clip, we heard you singing yesterday and then Lily James off the back saying, wow. When did you write that? Exactly. <laughs> I love how she delivers that line. That's brilliant. It is beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. And, it's the f- and that's the first time where we get a hint of where we are with the story, the fact that the, that the people that you're singing it to have never heard of it before. So, Danny, just tell us where the idea of this... It's interesting that bit you talk about, because the two women in it, um, Sophia and Lily, they're both moved almost to tears by the song. And there is that melancholy in their work, the Beatles' work, as well as the joy and the wonderful melody of it. There's a, a sub-note of melancholy in there as well, which... Like moves them to tears about regrets about their past or whatever it is that they're thinking about. Anyway, yeah, um, which is one of the wonderful things about their music, I think, and lifts it out of so many other comparisons. Like you can't compare them to ABBA, say, because people say, could you do it with any other group? But in our case, we're doing it. The Beatles have been erased from everybody's consciousness, memory records there's nothing on google there's no vinyl there's no cds nobody knows who you're talking about when you mention ringo star so it's like except this guy there's one unsuccessful singer songwriter and how useful that he is one of those um who actually does remember them or tries to recall them and begins to play them and you're never quite sure is he just doing the job on behalf of the public you know, to kind of rescue these great masterpieces? Or is he doing it in order to further what has been up until then a pretty stalled career? Whatever. Yeah. He becomes, in John Lennon's phrase, more popular than Jesus as a result of it. So it's, it's a sort of classic what if. Yeah, absolutely. Set up. Okay. What was the audition like? The audition was yeah. a delight, really. I did a tape and then it, Danny and Richard decided they wanted to meet me. So I went to, what was it, the Jerwood space, were we? That's where yes, we met was, for the first it, yeah. time. And I was terrified, of course, uh, you know. What's on the tape? What's on your... The tape was a, a Coldplay song. That was the instruction on the first email, a Coldplay song. And I did We Never Change. And so I, I did that in a, in a monologue from a play and I sent that off. So we met at the Jerwood space. And I was very nervous because I didn't know what to expect. Of course, I was meeting two titans of cinema, you know, and people I admired very much. But I realised I had to just enjoy it. Otherwise, if I was going to let the fear of it take over, I wouldn't have done a good job for one. And what did you have to do? I had to sing two songs from, from the script, which I had then read, and some scenes, I think two or three scenes. So I sang Yesterday, and I sang Back in the USSR, which got oh. Danny on his feet dancing around. So, Danny, what were you looking for? By that stage, I had a slight fear that the number of Beatles songs wouldn't be sustainable because all the guys that we'd seen up until that point some of whom were really wonderful players and singers the songs felt not I mean they're amazing songs but you thought are you gonna really bear 17 of them without any change into somebody else's music or anything even though the Beatles stuff is obviously enormous inbuilt variety within their catalogue but I began to worry it was going to be a bit karaoke And what it needed was a bit of soul, really. And what I was referring to earlier, the melancholy, you need to touch on that, not just the brightness of them. You need to touch that. And he did yesterday beautifully. And then he did USSR. And you know they're the rock and roll kings as well, you know. And they're one of the few groups that punk rock never slagged off because, of course punk rock in a way benefited from Helter Skelter or back in the USSR anyway he did his own acoustic version of USSR and I had me bouncing around the room and I just thought I know those songs aren't his but they feel like they're his and therefore let's cast him and it was just like when casting's like that it's so great because you just don't have any doubts you go it's him 
And it's almost like it casts itself, really. Yes, it's a great bit of casting because your voice, whether you're singing a George song or a John song or a Paul song, yeah. you nail it every single time. And Thank you. In the film, you're kind of doing an interpretation of the songs. You're not doing a karaoke. You're not trying to be the Beatles because, of course, no one in the film knows what the original sounded like. So what was your brief? What were you trying to do? The brief was, of course, to create our own versions of the songs because, as you say, they don't exist. So we can't be beholden to the originals because Jack wouldn't have that reference. You know, he wouldn't be able to go, how exactly was it? I let me imitate it. You know, he can only really go by what's in his miraculously is in his head still. So it was a really fun two months of improving my guitar playing and my piano playing quite a lot um, and creating our own versions of the song. So I was working with Daniel Pemberton, our composer, and um, his friend Ardem Milhan, who's a musician. We came together for about two months and we were you know, improving my, my skills and getting the songs to what they were, talking to Danny about them and going, well, how's this? Danny saying, well, this is how it's probably going to fit into the narrative and that kind of thing. And they naturally just became something different sometimes because it's just me and a guitar sometimes you know just me and a piano sometimes we had a ukulele band so here comes the sun things like that but what you realize is that these songs what's magic about them is that you strip them back to the handful of chords that they are and they're still amazing and so you can do all this stuff with them you can add ukuleles to them you can have it just one person and a guitar and there's still something so amazing about them and that's kind of what i learned about the songs in doing it danny music has always been a part of what you do you've always cared passionately about yeah. the music that's in your films also richard Kurt is famous for loving pop music yeah. and having pop music researchers at the end of the phone anytime <laughs> he wasn't so you're a perfect team in a way it's strange it's taken you so long to work together it is isn't it because people say oh you're an odd couple and then you go, well, actually, our love of music is some is absolutely... I mean, we will make films built around music, both of us. And we both also stayed at home and stayed obsessed with homegrown music as well. So it's the fact that Richard wrote this idea, I think, brought us together. Because we'd done a bit on the Olympics together. So we'd become friends through that. And then he was, and then he got this idea from this guy, Jack Barth, the original idea. And then because he is an absolute fanatic about the Beatles, Richard set off to write it. And I think, reading between the lines, he didn't want the responsibility of directing it because I think he feels he's too close to their work in a way. And the, so, I, so he sent it to me. And I went, as soon as I read it, it was a bit like the casting. They're the easiest decisions to make. You just go, I'll do it. And then we'll work everything out afterwards because you just think, why has nobody done that before? Yeah. Straight away, you just think, and what a lovely conceit to kind of have this double helix of a love letter to the music and a love letter from, ironically, Ellie, his manager, friend, to him, saying, why don't you love me? And that's ultimately his Was destination. the first thing that you did get permission and clearance to use the songs because if they'd said no you genuinely wouldn't have had a film i know you're absolutely right there and you've got to do a working title who produced it of course are the most experienced the most prodigious company that we have producing films in britain and they knew to make a rock solid deal and a very clever one i mean very expensive one but a very clever one with the with apple and sony whereby we were allowed to use anywhere between 15 and 18 songs but they weren't nominated they could be any from the catalogue they could be well-known ones or not so well-known ones and that gave us enormous freedom to bend anything towards Himesh's strengths or whoever was going to play the part at that stage and change during the filming and during the post during the editing even and we changed some at quite the last minute to keep the mix fresh of Beatles music in it. Um, Ed Sheeran is in this this movie plays a very important role playing himself that actually I think that's quite difficult we talk about on the show there's a there's a movie came out a few years ago in which Gordon Ramsay is in it and he has to play himself and he's terrible you know <laughs> so actually playing yourself is actually quite tough just explain a little bit about where Ed comes into the story and how he comes knocking on your door and so on so it's quite early on when Jack has just started experimenting with the Beatles songs that he knows and he puts out an EP and he and he goes on the telly and performs a song and then he gets a call and it's a guy saying that it's Ed Sheeran and Jack doesn't believe him but then Ed Sheeran turns up at his front door <laughs> and the support act has dropped out of Ed Sheeran's Moscow gig and would Jack like to be the support act and next thing you know Jack's playing a very appropriate song in front of a Moscow crowd and Ed kind of just sees that takes him under his wing and yeah. Jack starts flying in the same way that Ed did 
We should mention that your parents, played by Sanjeev Bhaskar and Mira Sale, yes. Sanjeev of this program, mm. who stands in for me sometimes when I'm not around. It's one of my favourite scenes is when your play is so natural. It's everyone will relate to what it, <laughs> trying to impress your parents. Yeah. And there you are singing. What's the song that you're trying to sing them? Uh, in the scene, it's called Leave It Be. Right. Actually, yeah. Okay. Um, and and they're not really they're not really that interested. <laughs> <laughs> Phone goes and so on. But but they're they're terrific fun. They're brilliant. And it was so nice to get to work with them finally. I'd met them a few times along the years. I mean, they're fantastic. And their work was very inspirational and, to and, me growing up. And the fact, it's one of the thoughts that occurred to me just walking out of the film, is that your ethnicity is not referred to at all. No. At any stage. No, no, you're no. just you're just Jack. Just Jack, yeah. I mean, that, and that's a, that's a huge step in a way, but not one I, I think that was consciously made. As far as I know, the, the casting net was cast wide. They weren't looking specifically to tick any boxes or anything like that. I just happened to be the right guy for the part. But that's, that's a, a huge step that... That the, the net was cast wide to begin with, and then the person who gets the part happens to be of, of minority ethnicity, and then now we have someone of that ethnicity playing a role like this, and that's a step forward. I think that's the way things need to continue. You're smiling, Danny. Yeah, no, there, there is a great gag. There is one gag right at the end of the film where, they, where he tries... <laughs> <laughs> at the marketing meeting and meetings, yes. which is in Los Angeles, and they tr they won't consider the White Album as a, ti as a possible title <laughs> yeah. because they consider it... <laughs> So didn't we impro that my response on the day? I think I we went, did. we have to change this. Yeah. And I changed it. And he's kind of said, you can't call it the White Album. And I said, how is that a problem? Yeah. There's some big live scenes at Wembley, which I imagine would phase some people, Danny. But when you've already mentioned 2012, <laughs> when you've done the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games, <laughs> there is nothing that is going to phase you. I had a great cinematographer, this guy, Chris Ross, who when he he's an engineer as well as a cinematographer. And when you set him a problem like that, which is how are we going to shoot the Ed Sheeran concerts because Ed had given us permission to shoot his crowd and blend them with Himesh's performance, which of necessity um, are going to happen, going to be recorded through the night after everyone's gone home. And Wembley, it's, provided we turn the sound down, Wembley will allow us to keep filming. And this guy, Chris Ross, worked out this plan. Now, I get all the credit for it, but it's actually, it's he that worked out the plan of how to cover this and shot it brilliantly. And it's a memory I'll never forget of him alone in Wembley. Wembley Stadium is a lonely place without 80,000 people. <laughs> when there's like 15 of you there and he's singing on his own at a turned down volume rate, but pretending there are 80,000 people screaming at him at the same time. Yeah. I'll never forget that. Danny, when you were on the show last, you said that you thought the media had an overly dark narrative of world events. And I wondered actually if in some way this film is part of a reaction to that. I mean, it's a, it's a light, positive, this is a good thing. People will walk out of a Danny Boyle film feeling good yeah. and inspired. It, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's also, it's a faithfulness towards the Beatles philosophy really, which remained about love and self-expression really. And that's one of the things they changed in our world. I think, and is something that will sustain us after some of the bad guys have hopefully disappeared. That there's something where it's about not going to war. It's about actually enjoying each other's presence for the time that we have together, really. And they really champion that, both as kids. Because remember, I think they went to Oklahoma, didn't they, when they were just the boy band? And there was a segregated audience. Yes, yes. And Lennon said, we're not playing. Mm. I don't care. It's in the Ron Howard film. It's, yeah, I don't it's, care it's what in that doing. We're not playing. We're not playing. You can have the money back. And so they desegregated the audience. But from then, when they were just kids standing up for what they believed in, principles, to later when they became articulate spokesmen in their different songs and, and then in their individual careers, there's something to aspire to in what they still allow us to dream about, really, which is about improving our world. Imesh, briefly, what are you doing next? What do we see you I'm in? I'm doing next? The Aeronauts um, with Eddie Redmayne and Felicity Jones. That's coming out towards the end of the year. And, yeah, I'm very excited for people to see that. Danny, can you tell us anything about your next project? Well, we've got, we're trying to get the life rights of these two guys. And it's tricky. I can't mention it until because otherwise the price will go up. <laughs> I mean, for this story, which is a great story, but we have to get the life rights. And, of course, everybody's got a lawyer these days who's just like, like no fool. And they're probably listening to the Simon Mayo show going, hmm, <laughs> I wonder if he's talking about us. Should we put the prize up? Who, who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Jason Isaacs. Uh, of course. Uh, Danny Ball, Himesh Patel, thank you so much. Thanks, Simon. Cheers.